We're in the TechCrunch studio today with George Zachary, partner at Charles River Ventures and an early investor in Twitter, Yammer, and Millennial Media. George, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me here. So very soon, Facebook is going to uh, go public, yeah. and there's a lot of talk about bubble, you know, bubble talk in Silicon Valley and the tech world, yeah. and you've been around the block a number of times. How do you view the world right now yeah. in terms of technology? I, I've models? been in tech personally since 77, and in venture capital, I've been an investor since 1995. Okay. So I've seen a lot. Plus, I, um, I studied the history of bubbles. Um, there's, there's actually 600 years of human history with bubbles, and it's actually a human phenomena. It's not just a short-term thing over the last 20 years. Okay, so t tell us a little bit about that. I didn't, I didn't know that you studied bubbles. Yeah, actually, uh, there's, there's some great books to read if people are interested. Uh, Mania, Panics and Crashes. It reads like a description of a bipolar person, but it also talks a little bit about a bipolar s society. And uh, the tensions that get created basically are, are socioeconomic in nature, where people feel like they're missing out, and that fuels the end of the bubble. Um, we're not quite there. We're getting there. Um, but... Uh, there's some just some fantastic books about uh, about how bubbles start. I mean, there are bubbles in that. There's the South Sea bubble with adventures in the South Sea, where people would give money to the adventures on boats, and then you got this bubble of people overfunding the boats. Yeah. Um, there's the tulip bubble. It's a good allegory for. <laughs> there's plenty of bubbles, and yeah. that's just driven by the fact that you know people are seeking treasure. Uh, I see. So maybe walk us through, pick pick an earlier bubble that the yeah. valley went through, and sort of walk us through what that looked like briefly. And then, you know, start to explain where we are, you think, now. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, and just to, to preface this, if you look at the last uh, 150 years of stock market history, you see an annualized return of 6.7 per year. Um, and that's on a real basis. And uh, without dividends, it's closer to five-ish. One of the things you'll see is that the bubbles come in waves. You see 15 years of sideways period in the stock market where there's up and down volatility, then 15 years of up with up and down volatility. In the year 2000, I told my, my partners, saying, we are in it for another 13 to 15 years where the market's going to be tough. And um, we can talk about that later. But w we're nearing the end of this bearish period. And we're starting to see a bubble emerge. You know, for me, this Facebook IPO is, has a lot of similarities with the Netscape IPO of 1994 and a lot of differences. Um, at that time, no one was saying it was a bubble. People were around saying, oh my God, Netscape's going to go public, public, it's a bubble. Actually, people were looking forward to it. People didn't know how it would price. It went out, it priced, and it was, the, the price jump was astronomical. And that started people talking about that there might be a bubble. But the real bubble in the 90s really didn't start till the late 90s. And while people call it a dot-com bubble, it was actually a bubble fueled by the Fed. The Fed pumped a ton of liquidity into the system to basically to guard against a catastrophic meltdown of the United States due to the, the year 2000 problems in terms of people's clocks resetting. Okay. So they pumped the market full of liquidity and that came out into the market in 2000, 2001. And then it, it actually causes a catalyst for the final part of the bubble up and then it's basically popping. And it always pops when there's no more buyers. So you have boom and bubble is basically that last phase where it starts to become unsustainable. You see exponential and ballistic rises in, in stock prices um, and you see it across the entire landscape, from the leaders in an industry to the seed stage company. Um, we're not quite there yet, but to me, there's a Netscape feeling about it because people feel like it's a brand new era. But back then, people weren't talking about a bubble. People now are talking about a bubble. But I think the question is, uh, what, how do you define a bubble, that something is overvalued? Value in, in monetary systems is only really relative. There's no so, so an idea of an absolute wealth. So... Bubble value is really relative value. Um, I do not think we're in a 99 kind of bubble time period this way. The so end it's, of a, it's a different beast. It's a different beast. The end of all bubbles are always marked by people borrowing money, debt, to buy equity or to buy assets. The last time we saw this was 2007-8 with the end of the real estate bubble. We just ran out of buyers. Right? The last end of those buyers are people who are faking their, their liar loans and, and making unsustainable commitments. And, but there were no more buyers after that, so it just ended. And to me, there's, there's a, little bit of that, a little bit of talk about that going on, but I don't see founders, I don't see investors, I don't see landlords or service providers basically borrowing money to buy equity. They're using their own. They're using their own capital, which right. they have, 
to put into equity. I don't see the individual investor um, increasing their margin account at, 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 stock, um, at stock brokerages. Um, in the last week, we had a reduction from, uh, in terms of the investor sentiment to the, actually the lowest uh, suggested amounts of holdings of NASDAQ tech companies. Uh, so there's enough fear in the market that it tells me that we're not at a bubble yet. When there is no fear, that's when we're near the end of the bubble. So if we're in mid-May here, 2012, what phase or, or sh at what point on the curve are we in your, in your mind? Yeah, so what, if you look at kind of phases of tech bubbles, um, the first phase is when a leader in the space does something breakthrough and gets an extraordinarily high val valuation. And that was Facebook, um, you know, in, the, in one of its first rounds when they decided to not take the buyout offer and raise money at a high price. It wasn't the Greylock offer when Greylock offered $500 million valuation, because that was high, but it wasn't ridiculous. It was when Yuri Milner and DST invested, and everyone said, whoa, it's a bubble. It's when Microsoft invested in Facebook, and people said, whoa, it's a bubble. How could this ever be worth 10 to $15 billion? Now, that kind of characterizes the first phase, where the first leader has this very high valuation, and people say, oh, it's a bubble. It's not really an indicator that the bubble's about to break. Usually when the bubble's about to break is in the second or third phases, and those second and third phases look like the following. The second phase, you have the competitor companies. I'm an investor in one, which is Twitter, where people apply a high valuation to Twitter, and they, they say, well, relative to Facebook, it should have this valuation. And you have these set of leading companies. They have good metrics. They have good users. They have real engagement, and they carry a, a, mark, to, a mark to Facebook, a mark to leader kind of valuation. That's when you know you're in the second phase. The end of the second phase is really, you really start to see that a couple companies get bought. Um, the one that's very obvious to me that defines this delineation between the second and third phase is the Instagram purchase. It wasn't an irrational purchase. It looks irrational. Why is it worth a billion dollars? Well, the question is, it's worth 1% of Facebook, which is different than it being worth a billion dollars. Um, so you're starting to see some mark-to-market of the companies that are not the leaders but be became the leaders, and then you saw this transaction that happened. The ideal point to be an investor is still now and actually still for a while. And the reason why is there's a set of follow-on companies, the Hootsuites of the world and other people that are saying, hey, we're going to raise money at a $500 million price tag. Well, why? Well, because these other companies, which aren't Facebook or Twitter, but might be right underneath them in terms of leadership, they have valuations. So you see this cascading multiple that goes from the leader right. to, the, to the second tier, to the third tier, then to the fourth. So just to make sure I've got that point right, you're basically saying that there are a number of companies underneath layers above the leaders, and since they, they're not having real revenues, or you yeah. can't really price the lifetime value of the user, you're marking it to the market leader, yeah. which in and of itself isn't being marked accor priced that accordingly. That's right. Price according to the market, the, um, the public market. That, that's right. Okay. So you know, I think to me, this this the Instagram purchase really reminds me of my. I had the same feeling when Microsoft acquired Hotmail in I think it was January of 1998. People said Microsoft, the leading software company, bought this webmail thing for 400 million dollars. There was a lot of people were astounded. It was like it has no revenue. Like. It just sends messages to people. Mm -hmm. uh, you, people use it to communicate with other people. were astounded. And people said, oh, you know, that's a bubble. Oh, I'm so pissed off that Hotmail got bought for 400 and my messaging mm -hmm. thing didn't. The, I heard the exact same things with Instagram. And Instagram's interesting because the leading web company, Facebook, has now, is now trying to buy the leading mobile app player. Well, you could debate whether it's a leading mobile app player. Right. So I see it's incredibly parallel. But in, back in 98, we're still not in the full-fledged bubble. We're still in this kind of boundary between second phase and third phase, and that Hotmail transaction is what started it. Now, you look back at it, Microsoft doesn't complain that they bought Hotmail for $400 million, because it's a great customer acquisition tool for them. Absolutely. Now, if, OK, so the Facebook IPO is going to happen very soon. Next week. Right. Oh, no, uh, this week. This yes. Week. Yeah. And so if, um, what is, I'm going to ask you a two-part question. What does the rest of 2012 look like to you uh, as an investor? Question, yeah. And then what does 2013 look like? What does 2012 look like? Well, we're in this eye of the hurricane period where everyone right now is just like battening down the hatches and wondering what's going to happen, the date of that IPO, what's going to happen after the IPO, how are people going to price this? 
that's going to be the second part of the hurricane. Okay. The, I don't know how people are going to act, but you know, looking at the public market, you can see that the small cap stocks are basically have started to lose some relative power relative to the whole market. And that's usually a sign that you're in an aging bull market, usually. But it's not always a sign, statistically. And I think what we're seeing is that there is still reluctance on the part of the public to believe that everything in the world is fine. And we're climbing that wall of worry. And the wall of worry is, is not over. The people still have worries. As long as there's worries, you don't actually have a full, you're not at the end of the bubble. So my belief is that the Facebook IPO will do well. I don't know if it's going to, I don't know if it's going to go to a $200 billion valuation. I know lots of people I know and myself, we all have biases wanting to believe that. Sure. Because uh, then, you know, cash will be raining from the sky. But I guess, let, let's rephrase the question a little bit differently, which is for, for other startups out there, other people with companies that have gained some traction, how, how should they be thinking about 2012, right? Some of them are going to be going for financing. Yeah. Some of them are going to be looking at M&A. Um, how do you think that, you know, le leaders should be thinking about that. Matters what stage you're at. Are, are you talking about? Let's say early stage. Early stage. So past seed stage. Yes. But not you know might have I'm a million users or ten I'm million. I'm going to assume that for the best founders and best companies, seed capital is always going to be available. That's right. So let's say between A and C. Um, I think what you're going to see is that you're going to have financings are still going to be strong. They're still going to be taking place. There's lots of public market investors and limited partner investors that want to invest into venture capital. That's going to continue. You're seeing a winnowing of the amount of firms that are profitable out of 800 firms in technology venture capital. Yeah. 30 are profitable over the last 10 years. Wow. But remember, in Hollywood, there's lots of movie production studios that are unprofitable for a long time, but they don't go out of business because people still want the dream of funding the next big movie. So I, I, that's going to this phenomenon is going to continue for a while. People are chasing these legends and myths, and but not even myths. They're the realities of this could be the next humongous thing. Right. So maybe the players will interchange, but the money will always be there. That's what I think. Got it. And I, I think the rest of the year, if you have any traction, uh, you should be able to be financed. But people are looking for growth on growth transaction. People are looking for the exponential curves. Because, it, because the exponential curve is a strong indicator that you have product market fit. And if you have product market fit, you should, you should be able to monetize in a certain way. Got it. And so final question if is... If you don't have that exponential curve, right. the, the kind of valuation you're going to get, either you won't get one or it's not going to be good. Understood. And so final question is, the, I think the last breakout kind of social application that has hit, let's say Pinterest or some of the yeah. communication apps like... Uh, what's going on with Vox or, or, or things like that. Do you think the next one will be mobile? Yes. Mobile is the platform that we will be with for quite a long time, whether it's going to be a mobile phone or a Google Glasses kind of thing. It's still going to be mobile because um, it goes with you wherever you are. You don't have to be chained to your desk. But I'm talking about the next exponential breakout where you just see the user growth you know, kind of go like this. and then Yeah, it, it will be mobile. And you're, we're going to have more people come online in the next 10 years that are, than are on online right now. Got it. That's a huge opportunity. Great. Cool. I think we'll see Twitter have a billion users in the next couple of years. Um, you know, and, and just the ratchet of how many users you have and what's successful. When I got in this business in 1995, there wasn't Web 2.0 or even really Web 1.0. It was like Web 0.1. If you had 50,000 users, that was considered awesome. Um, and now, to be considered awesome, you have to have some amount of millions of active, engaged users. Not downloaded, not downloads or registrations, but people who love the product and are engaging in it. You look at the ratio of DAUs, daily active users, to yeah. monthly active users, you get a sense of the excitement. You also look at the churn rate. We've uh, done some work, and we see that there's a correlation between churn rate and exit. So actually, this is an interesting question. Do you think that some of the companies right now, like let's say on the communication side or on the uh, social video side, right? That's what everyone's talking about right now in terms of applications. Do you think that growth is organic or sustainable, or are they um, piggybacking off of, uh, you know, Open Graph and Twitter, but it's going to go like this? Uh, I'm inclined to believe more of the latter. Okay. Which is you're likely to have these impulse waves up. And another competitor can come by with a slightly better product, and you can have an impulse wave down. So, if you're so founders should be looking for yeah. how to implement switching costs in the product, how to build network effects into the product, 
that that shut down your the the user's desire to switch out. Understood. All right, George. Well, thank you for coming sure. in and Thanks sharing for having me. your knowledge. Thanks. Thanks, Emil.